when professional Bigfoot hunters come face to face with the mythical monster himself, they believe they finally have validation for their life's work. Instead, they find themselves embroiled in a bizarre religion. And then we meet a young woman who recently lost her sister to a drug overdose. While she's still grieving her sister's death, Paranormal events begin to plague the household. Is it possible that our sister is trying to send a message from beyond the grave? Or is a more sinister force slowly invading the household? Today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host Jason Carpenter, I'm having a great day. I hope you guys are having a great day too. A great day for me with a little asterisk. Again, long-time listeners, not long-time listeners of the show, if you've been listening to the other episodes this week, I have an earache, and my tongue sore, and all that stuff. But I don't want to just complain about the physical ailments that I have, unless you have a cure. I have a P.O. Box. If you have medicine to send me for this, go ahead and send it to my P.O. Box. That's legal. Don't send me a bunch of narcotics as my eyes shift from side to side. Speaking of someone who often sends me narcotics, I'm ratting you out to the FBI. It's one of our legacy Patreon supporters. Give it up for everyone's best friend, Bill Gapes. Everyone give a round of applause to Bill Gapes. Walking into Dead Rabbit Command, (laughs) smuggling in the drugs I need for my pain. Bill, you're going to be our captain, our pilot this episode. If you guys can't support the Patreon, or if you don't know friends who have drugs, that's fine too. Just help spread the word about the show. Now, Bill, I'm going to go ahead and toss you the keys. Oh, and we're not even sorry. We got to do Fan Art Friday, too. I forgot. Look at this submission for Fan Art Friday. This is from our subreddit, the Dead Rabbit Radio subreddit. It's from Fight Me and Unreal. This is the anatomy of a Dead Rabbit Radio episode. He has it listed as 80% paranormal stuff, 20% Jason making weird noises with his mouth. I think that's fairly accurate and very, very funny. I liked it when I saw it and I was thinking about it. I wanted to profile it in Fan Art Friday. Thank you so much for creating that Fight Me and Unreal. Really, really cool. And if you guys have other Fan Art Friday, just go ahead and send it to me however you guys get a hold of me, and we will see about profiling that as well. Bill Gapes, I'm going to go ahead and... We're going to start making mouth noises. Bill Gapes, I'm going to go ahead and toss you the keys to the Jason Jalopy. We are leaving behind Dead Rabbit Command. We are headed on out to North Carolina. (laughs) Bill Gapes is driving us out to North Carolina. Specifically, we're headed to the Pisgah National Park. That's in the mountains of McDowell County. And we're driving through the woods. It's beautiful out. Little birds chirping, squirrels are like just walking around, storing nuts for the winter. And while we're driving through the woods and we're looking at all this nature stuff, there's actually about seven dudes walking through the woods. And this is Bigfoot 911. It's a Bigfoot research group. They go out, they spend their weekends in the woods looking for the mythical man himself. Will they ever find him? You know, that, that Bigfoot, people have been searching for him in modern times, really since the 1950s. It's been 60 years at this point. And every year that passes, you lose a little more faith that Bigfoot's going to show up. But what a hobby to have, right? Like, how many people's hobbies allow them to walk around in the woods with their buddies? Like, it's really cool. Like, whether or not they ever find... Bigfoot or Sasquatch. It's cool. I think that's always fun about ghost hunting, too. Whether or not you find proof of ghosts or see ghosts, it's all about having fun. The bonding memories. Like, I used to remember hanging out with Steve and Mauricio and Josh and Jason and all these people. Ghost hunting. Right? Jackie and Liz. I, we enjoy this stuff. So, whether or not... I mean, I did see ghosts. <laughs> it's, it's quite traumatizing. But it's the memories, too. So, I'm not... Do I think they're ever going to find Bigfoot? Probably not, but it'll be fun. It's a fun journey. It's a fun journey. Just don't get too obsessed about it. But anyways, this group, Bigfoot 911, is led by a guy named John Bruner. And it's nighttime, and they're walking around with these glow sticks. They're kind of like holding them out. I don't know why glow sticks. I don't know. Maybe they had flashlights as well. Maybe they just got done going to one of their nephew's birthday parties, and they had all these glow sticks. And they're like, let's save money on batteries. But on August 4th, 2017, they're walking through the forest. And using these glow sticks, they find him. They find Bigfoot. You guys didn't hear about this in the news? You didn't guys hear about this proof that Bigfoot exists? Now, this story was sent to me by our Bigfoot expert, Bennett. He sent us a ton of stuff about Bigfoot stories. He's really big into pig people. 
He found a list of every Pigman legend in every state. I think there was only three states that don't have a Pigman legend. I'm still going through that list. Bennett always emails me Bigfoot stories and pig people stories. And then he always says, oh, listen, I'm not really into Bigfoot. I'm just doing I'm just doing this. Uh-huh. Sure. Sure you are, Bennett. Bennett is a member of Bigfoot 911. He's throwing the glow sticks. He's throwing them so hard and fast. Good job, Bennett. Thank you for this recommendation. He always does send really good stuff. He, they're throwing these glow sticks, and Bigfoot starts picking up rocks and throwing them at Bigfoot 911. And then runs away from the scene. But they saw him. They saw Bigfoot, which is, like I said, I've seen ghosts, and I've seen demons, and I've seen demonically possessed people, but I have to say, maybe it's because I've seen those things, I'm a fairly jaded, because, you're oh, great, <laughs> your, your loved one's head spinning around, they're vomiting blood and speaking a Latin, you're like, ah, oh, if you've seen one demonic possession, you've seen them all, I think I'd be really impressed to see Bigfoot. Or an alien. Like, if I look at the scale of... I've seen ghosts and I've seen demons. Maybe if I saw a named demon, like Gamigan, or Bald Bareth, or Lucifer. Like, one of, like, the named dudes. I might be a little impressed. But if I saw Gamigan, I'd ride him around. He's actually a demonic donkey. But seeing Bigfoot would be... That would be cool. Like, I like clearly seeing Bigfoot. Not like you see something in the woods that might be a bear. Like, clearly seeing Bigfoot. I'd rank it below an alien. Like, I'd rather see a sexy alien. <laughs> You're like, Jason, don't, didn't you say do you don't want to get too rambly? I'd rather see a sexy alien, like a sexy humanoid reptilian. I mean, a, actually, a sexy human, it's a sexy human alien. That was a total Freudian slip. Then a sexy reptilian, then a sexy gray. And then, like, a normal alien. Like, I'll lump all those together. Like, if it's just a normal alien, it could be a reptilian or gray or human. It doesn't matter, robot. And then Bigfoot... And then, like, maybe another cryptid. <laughs> this has become a tier list on the S level. I have sexy aliens. Any other cryptid. But Bigfoot would be cool. Like, I saw Bigfoot clearly. I was walking through the woods. <laughs> a bunch of glow sticks. I just came from Party City, USA. But they saw Bigfoot. That happened on August 4th, 2017. So you think... I mean, a lot of people claim they see Bigfoot. It doesn't really make national news unless... There's proof. Well, on August 9th, I don't know, I don't know how this passed my attention. I wasn't doing the podcast at the time, but thanks, Bennett, for bringing this to my attention. On August 9th, 2017, Bigfoot held a press conference. What happened was Bigfoot di did hold a press conference. Bigfoot turns out to be a man named Gawain McGregor. He's a 36-year-old dude. All this time, people have been looking for Bigfoot. Turns out it was just some guy named Gaywin living in North Carolina. Gaywin comes forward and goes, guys, I know that Bigfoot 911 said that they saw Bigfoot. And they did, in a sense, because I am Bigfoot. Gaywin has built a Bigfoot suit out of raccoon fur. And it looks as gross as you think it would. It looks like a guy covered himself in glue and rolled down a hill of roadkill and carcasses of animals. And it's just this patchwork of fur. And you can I mean, it looks nothing like you would expect Bigfoot to look, other than it's big and it's hairy. But then, like, people's dads could be mistaken for Bigfoot. This guy, he, his eyes are all jacked up. I mean, this guy's not he's, not, he's not the best costume designer. It's just him covered in raccoon fur. And he goes, listen, I was in the woods of Pishkah National Park that night. It was 11 p.m. as Jason looked back over at his notes. I was there that night. But I didn't throw rocks. So <laughs> the police are like, oh, you were there? You were throwing rocks? No, 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 I didn't throw rocks. I didn't assault them. But the Bigfoot they saw was me. And people are like, what? Like, So was it a hoax? Were you running around in the woods to scare people? Were you in on it? Like, did you know Bigfoot 911 is going to be there and you're trying to be part of this hoax and get them publicity. And he goes, none of that. What? That's foolish. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I actually was there because I worship Bigfoot. I'm the only member of a Bigfoot religion that I made up. <laughs> That's why I'm the only member, because I made it up. He believes in this thing he calls Enkiduism. Enkiduism is the belief that Sasquatches are gods. They're deities that walk on Earth, and they're descended from a guy named Ink Kaidu. Ink Kaidu is a character 
from the book or story Gilgamesh, which I've never read. Apparently, it's like the oldest novel ever written. It's about this dude who's like, I'm the best dude on the planet. Like, his mom's a, a goddess, and like, his dad, his dad's just like the moon or something like that. And he shows up on Earth, and he's like pushing people around. He's really strong. So when he's pushing villagers down, they're like, ah, they're flying like a couple miles away. No, we needed that villager. He was the only one who could construct the aqueducts. Ah, you don't need aqueducts. Just worship me. And he, Gilgamesh is like this king walking around Samaria or something like that. And everyone's like, dude, this guy's like really cool because he's super strong and he's like a decent leader, I guess. I mean, we keep losing one tenth of our population every time he walks, walks through our village. So the mom, his mom is like looking down on earth and being like, you know what? My son needs to learn a little bit of humility. So the mom goes, what I need to do is create a big giant hairy dude to wrestle him. That will teach my son to have more manners. So she creates this dude named Enkidu who is two-thirds, he described as two-thirds monster, one-third man. His body is covered in fur. And he represented the nature that mankind had abandoned to live in the cities. So he comes walking into town, and Gilgamesh is like, oh, finally, like, a challenge. Like, I've been pushing over these villagers like they're nothing. So him and this furry dude start wrestling, and then they become friends. It's just like when you were in school, and your bully's like, I'm going to beat you up after school. And you're like, after school, let's go right now. And you're, like, boxing on the playground, and the bully's like, oh, dude, you're actually not so bad. <laughs> He's being wheeled into the hospital. He's being wheeled in because you, you beat him up. You broke all of his ribs. Uh, you, let's hang out tomorrow. And you're like, yeah, sure. You know, like when you fight a dude, there's a level of respect for him. It's like that. So he's wrestling this guy. And then that actually calms down Gilgamesh. Apparently. <laughs> based, based on based on the Wikipedia that I read and slightly remember. <laughs> that is the plot of the world's oldest novel. And then eventually, Enkidu dies. Because he's not a deity in the sense that Gilgamesh is. And Gilgamesh always was super sad. Like, he's like, oh, no, that was my best friend. Uh, that was my best friend. Like, he was super furry, and, like, we cuddled at night, and he was warm, and we wrestled a lot. <laughs> People are like, wait a second, what, bro, what, what? We thought he was just, like, your Robin to your Batman. You were cuddling at night, and he was warm? I don't know, forget all that stuff, Gilgamesh said. <laughs> As he started pushing villagers around, forget it, forget it. The point is, is, like, everyone should remember what a cool dude Enkidu was. And most people do, like English majors probably remember who Enkidu is, and history people probably remember, histo historians is what they're normally called, historians probably remember In Enkidu, and I didn't know about this guy, I've never read Gilgamesh, <laughs> this is very, 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 you've made it perfectly clear you have never read Gilgamesh, but he's like, whatever, it sounds dope, pushing people around, and then Harry Dude shows up, the end. But I've never heard of this guy. Well, apparently, Gawain has. Gawain has learned this stuff, and he believes that Enkidu is the original Sasquatch, which I could see that. I could see where that belief's at. So he created this religion called Enkiduism, and he dresses up as Bigfoot, and he goes into nature, and he telepathically bonds with Bigfoot. By dressing as the Sasquatch, he goes, shamans would dress as the fox or dress as the wolf. I'm dressing as who I want to communicate with. I'm dressing as Bigfoot. And it's made out of this raccoon fur. I go into the woods and he has a Bigfoot prayer, which when I read that, I was like, oh, dude, this is going to be so funny. And it's not. It's kind of boring. But I'll read it to you anyways, um, just, just in case you ever need it. Right now, you're listening to this podcast and Bigfoot's pounding on your cab and you're like, please read it. Please read it out loud. Here's the Bigfoot prayer. Here, I'll shut my closet door so it'll be extra spooky while I say it. Hear me, O Sasquatch, children of Enkidu. In your great mercy, may you walk forever before me, guiding me through the forest and guarding me from every danger that may come. Dude, if you're going to make up a religion, make it funny. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, make it funny. You're like, Jason, religions aren't supposed to be funny. They're supposed to be sacred. Yeah, but you could have, like, a total funny one, like Bigfoot. <laughs> when I was walking along the beach, there was two set of footprints, mine and these giant ones. But then soon I realized there was only a giant pair of footprints. You know, stuff like that. You could do a bunch of funny stuff, like Amazing Grace, but it's Amazing Race. Because <laughs> he has big feet. He's always running away from you. I don't know something funny. 
Be more funny is what religions, I think, would get a lot more adherence if they were funny. So I'm a little disappointed. But anyway, so he says that was me. Now here, I have, I'm have i not just going on for 20 minutes about this. Here is what I find so fascinating about this story. Like the guy coming up with his own religion, that's fine. We've come across stuff like that before. Again, work on the prayer. Make it clever. What I find more fascinating about this, other than the fact that I'm bullying this guy's religion, is this. John Bruner says, no, that wasn't him that we saw in the woods that night. He says what we saw was eight feet tall, and Gaywin is not eight feet tall. And there's photographs of him in this gross outfit. And John Bruner goes, listen, that is not what we saw in the woods. If we had seen that in the woods, we would have known it was a man in a suit. Even at 11 p.m., we would have known that was not a real person. That was not the real Bigfoot. They also said it ran so quickly. No human could run that fast. So it could be John Bruner saving face because he didn't want to admit that his group saw this guy in this suit and actually thought it was Bigfoot. But what I think is fascinating, we're going to finish it up like this. You have a team of Bigfoot researchers and they have all this gear. They have all the glow sticks money can buy. They're out there looking for a Bigfoot. Bigfoot shows up. It is most likely gay one in this suit. And because it's dark and it's all lit by glow sticks that, you know... You could mistake the suit, but they didn't get a photo of him. And these are Bigfoot researchers out there. Out there with all the technology to hunt Bigfoot. They don't get a photo of him. Here's my conspiracy theory. What if, because we know there's very, very few photos of Bigfoot. There's a new video that made the rounds, and it's like a two-second long video. I was super disappointed. I saw the screenshot. I go, that looks intriguing. It's like a two-second video, and people are like, this has to be fake. Like, who records two seconds of a video? I'll put it in the show notes. It looks interesting, but it's just, it doesn't make sense why you would only record two seconds. But what if... We know that it's hard to take photographs of UFOs. It's hard to take photographs of Bigfoot. It goes seem to be the easiest thing to photograph, and even those are fairly hard. I'm not talking about orbs, because those aren't ghosts. But what if you can't take a photo of Bigfoot? Like, that's just, it's some sort of paranormal thing. The photo it turns out being blurry. The camera doesn't work. But what if it extends past that? What if you can't even take an, a photo of a fake Bigfoot? A fake Bigfoot. Like, think about that. This They were ready to take all these photos. They were hunting this monster. One appears, and even though it wasn't the real Bigfoot, there would be no reason why cameras would fail. There would be no sort of high strangeness or paranormal activity in messing with their technology. Even a fake Bigfoot they're unable to take a photograph of. That's fascinating to me. Like, even if you're dressed up in the suit and not the real creature for whatever reason... You don't take a photo of it. Now, it could be that it's so shocking, you don't remember your camera's there. But remember, these are professional Bigfoot hunters. This is kind of what they're there for, is to document this stuff. I wonder if... Now I'm putting on our conspiracy cap, because this is kind of like just a train of thought. But if you could have special forces all over the world dress up like monsters, you have like Spetsnats, you have Russian special forces, they're like, I want to suck your blood, they're, they're in these really cheap Dracula costumes, people are like, ah, what if you had special forces, assassins, scouts, and they're dressed like cryptids, and they don't show up on, they, they, the government doesn't know why this works, they go, we don't get it, if, if we send in a team of Navy SEALs, into enemy territory, they may get picked up on, like, sensors and stuff like that. But if we take those Navy SEALs, we dress, we dress them up like the Monster Squad. You have a werewolf, the mummy too, creature from the Black Lagoon swimming in your pool. They're all showing up. They, they don't get picked up on sensors. Photographs, video cameras don't work. They're all blurry. I don't know. That's the conspiracy cap thing. But I do th find it very interesting that even in the face of a fake Bigfoot, they still can't take a picture. Because it makes sense when you're face-to-face -face with the real Bigfoot. We've had stories of there's some like disturbance in the area or they get they lost time, however you want to describe it. A fake Bigfoot would have none of that stuff and they still can't take a photo. Very, very interesting story. Bennett, thank you so much for sending it over. Bill Gapes. I'm going to toss you the keys of the Carpenter Copter. We are leaving behind North Carolina. We are headed on out to... 
a small town in the middle of America. <laughs> this is one of those stories. People, I get why people are hesitant to give out their information online. But we don't have a name for any of the people involved, so we'll be making those names up. We don't have a location, but we do have a period of time. It was actually just earlier this year, a couple months ago, this all started. This was written by a user known as Blend Times 3. 34-year-old married woman has a daughter. Everything's going okay. But her sister has a drug problem. Now, she doesn't live with her sister. It's her younger sister. But when a family member has an addiction, the whole family has the addiction. And she loves her younger sister. She remembers the good times they had together before she spiraled into this drug use. One of the hobbies that her younger sister had was she was a ghost hunter. Which again, great, great hobby. Maybe not after this story, you may reconsider it, but it's just such a fun thing to do. Look to see, yeah, that's a, that's a good, I think, see if there's any ghost hunting groups in your area. You might make a really good group of friends, even if it's just online, have a little group hanging out. Yeah, I, I recommend that. Let's call, so we're going to call the narrator of this story, we're going to call her Rebecca. These names are all shots in the dark. And then we're going to call her sister, Melissa. Well. Earlier this year, Rebecca gets a phone call from her mom. It's panicked. Her mom's in a panic. And she goes, listen, Rebecca, I need you to go make sure all the doors in the house are locked. You go, go make sure. And Rebecca's like, what's going on? Mom's like, listen, Melissa is, she, she might come by. She might come by. Make sure your doors are locked. If she comes to your house, don't let her in. Call 911. Now, nobody wants to get a phone call like that, even with someone who's addicted to drugs. I mean, life can be chaotic from time to time, but it looks like Melissa was actually dangerous. Not breaking in your house, stealing your purse, taking some money to go buy her drug of choice. But threatening people. That type of phone call. Lock your doors. Don't let your sister, don't let the little girl that you grew up with inside your house. And it frightened Rebecca. She was worried about her child. She was worried about her husband. And she was worried about herself and her sister's well-being as well. So it's not the perfect situation. But she never stops wanting to see her little sister return to that woman she once was. But earlier this year, around May, June, in that time period, Melissa dies of a drug overdose. And for the first six weeks after this untimely death, Rebecca just has a really hard time of dealing with it. Like she said, every single day I was crying. Every single day I was breaking down. It was just that loss and that powerlessness and that rage. First six weeks this is going on. One weekend, she goes to the cemetery and she meets Melissa's ex-boyfriend at the cemetery, and they're talking a bit, and they're reminiscing. And the boyfriend, let's call him Charles, he tells Rebecca, he goes, you know, this, I don't know if this is the right thing I should be saying, but, you know, Melissa was a big ghost hunter. She was really into this stuff, and the night she died, before I knew that she had passed away, it was late at night, me and my current girlfriend are sleeping in bed in my place. And my girlfriend wakes up in the middle of the night. Something startles her. And in the darkness of the room, she saw something standing next to the bed on my side, staring down at me. It looked like this figure was trying to wake me up. But once it realized that my girlfriend was watching it, this phantom, this shape, slowly started to walk away from the bed and then disappeared. So the next morning, when I got the phone call that Melissa had died, my girlfriend wasn't surprised. My girlfriend says, I think I saw her last night come to you. And my girlfriend grew up in a house that was haunted. She knows the signs to look for. And she immediately felt the energy in the house change. Just like the house she grew up in, this house was now haunted as well. 
But it's not just an unusual feeling as we walk through the house. Just yesterday, a bowl in the kitchen, just sitting there, exploded into ceramic shards. So something's in my house, and I don't know what its plans are. It's probably Melissa. Maybe she's upset about my girlfriend, but I don't know. I just figured you'd want to know. Rebecca said that after this cemetery visit, she felt better. Like, she no longer was on the edge every day. It wasn't like she was gasping for air. She still was sad. She still missed her sister. But it wasn't this daily chaos. Things were starting to settle down in her heart. One week after the cemetery, and this is the day she leaves this post online, she's sitting at home at night. Her daughter's not feeling good, and she's trying to take care of her, comfort her as much as she can. And she's puttering around the house, doing chores, keeping an eye on her daughter. Her husband's not there. Her mother, who lives with them, she has a little apartment in the basement. She's out as well. She's out on a date. So Rebecca kind of has the house to herself, but, you know, her daughter's sick. But you know what I mean? Like, she's just kind of moving around the house. Her daughter's getting some rest. And at a certain point in the night, she realizes, wait a second. Where's my dog? Where's my dog at? My dog is normally, like, right between my legs, constantly following me around. Like, what? What? And she realizes she has no idea where her dog is. But whatever. <laughs> you know, dogs tend to be a little goofy sometimes. Could be off doing something in the house. She has a sick daughter to take care of. But at one point, her daughter needs something. She needs something to treat her daughter. And it's in her mom's room. Mom's room is in the basement. She walks down the stairs. And she sees in the darkness of the basement... Her dog and her cat just sitting there, staring at the back door. She's like, what? Like, that answers the question of where the dog's at, but why is the dog here? What are they looking at? But whatever. She has a sick daughter. Dogs, <laughs> dogs are weird. Cats are lazy. There's probably a reasonable explanation for this. As she begins to approach her mom's room... She feels unwelcome. The door to her mom's room seems forbidden. And in the darkness of her mom's room, something is emanating hostile thoughts. You're not welcome here. Leave now. This isn't your place. Go. But she needs this medicine. She needs this treatment for her daughter. And and you, as a child, when we have those feelings, we tend to leave the area. We don't go down dark hallways. We don't like the certain room in our house. We don't like the moldy basement or the spooky attic. But as an adult, we get those feelings from time to time. You have to brush them off because you have adult responsibilities. And at first you're thinking, oh, maybe I'm just a little... It's weird because it's dark down here. It's spooky. The animals are acting weird. So she goes to go into the mom's room to get this stuff out. But the panic sets in. At a certain point, she realizes this isn't just me being paranoid. Something is telling me to leave. And she grabs what she needs out of her mom's room, and she runs out of there. Runs back upstairs. And on her way through the house, she's turning on the lights. The kitchen light is on. The living room light is on. The lights in the hall are on. And she's sitting there in her own house. And she is unwelcome. It spread from the basement. It spread up the stairs. And into all the other rooms of her house. She doesn't feel safe where she's at. The post ends where it's three in the morning now. And she doesn't want to go to the bathroom. She has to go to the bathroom. But she's basically retreated into a single room. She doesn't feel safe in her own house. And it ends like this, quote, I'm so uncomfortable in my own home, and I have never felt like this. How can I find out if she is here? And how can I get her to go 
if she is, unquote. So the idea is that Rebecca has is that this is the ghost of Melissa coming back from beyond the veil to haunt Rebecca's house. But is it? This is such an interesting story because we have a couple different things going on. One, we could have the idea that this is the ghost of Melissa. Why would she be so hostile to her own sister? We don't know the full relationship. See, we know Rebecca's side of the story. But Rebecca does say that she did care about Melissa. She loved her sister. But if Melissa's coming back from the dead, we could see her messing with the, the ex-boyfriend and the boyfriend's current girlfriend, which would still require a fairly malevolent spirit. A lot of times spirits come back and they'll forgive people. I know that you weren't able to come to my funeral. I now see why you made the decisions you did, blah, blah, blah. Breaking bulls. And that's high-level poltergeist activity. Like, that's not very common. Assuming this story's true, right? The story could be totally made up. Anything we cover on the show could be totally made up. But assuming this story's true, that's high-level paranormal phenomenon. Breaking things. Exploding them. Not even knocking them off a shelf. So she would come back. She'd be very, very malicious. And you would have to think, here's our first conspiracy cat moment. Is the ghost of a drug addict still addicted to their drug of choice? People who are like hardcore drug addicts of heroin, or not even heroin, like people who are hardcore addicts of anything, gambling or sex, you would imagine at a certain point that does that addiction stop being a physical one and become a soul addiction? It's actually affecting your soul. And if you die in the grasp of that, and see, I don't, th see, I don't think so. I don't think so, but conspiracy cap fully on, could it be? So, I mean, that could be, right? We have to accept that if we believe in ghosts, it's possible there is some sort of lingering addiction issues in that. It's weird. I never thought about that before. Would the ghost of a drug addict still be addicted to something? Because we do have stories of, like, ghosts committing sex crimes and, and things like that. So why wouldn't... The... But I original... this was my original hypothesis. We may go back to that one. My original hypothesis was... It's not her sister... I don't think it's her sister. I think when you're a ghost hunter, you make enemies. You do. When you're a Bigfoot hunter, Bigfoot doesn't take it personally. Me like that you spend time in great outdoors. We friends in the end. He's able to evade your cameras anyways. Bigfoot, he's pretty neutral. I think when you look at a D and d alignment scheme, Bigfoot would be neutral. But demons are chaotic evil. And ghosts, I think, it could be that your, you know, a beloved one saying goodbye to you one last time. That's a good ghost. And then you have neutral ghosts that are just the recordings of Mary, Queen of Scots with no head walking down the hallway. And then we have ghosts knocking over bowls and making p people feel uncomfortable in their own house. That would be, again, an evil ghost. And when you're a ghost hunter and when you're looking into this stuff, you can rack up an enemies list quite easily. Now, I don't know the extent of her ghost hunting. That's why I'm saying when you talk about it being a hobby, out of the difference between looking up at the stars for UFOs, hunting Bigfoot, or ghost hunting, I think ghost hunting is the most dangerous of the three. Hunting hunting is probably the most dangerous because you're going to get gored by an elk or something like that. But ghost hunting tends to lead you into demonic hunting, right? You're, you, the two have such crossover. And you start to rack up an enemies list. You're basically making yourself known. Most people live their life never really coming into contact with any sort of criminal activity. You might get mugged. You might get beat up at some point in your life. But you don't have any idea of the criminal networks that are underlying in your area. You may read them about them in the newspaper. If you become a bounty hunter and you make your money getting people who've skipped bond, if you're a police officer and you make your living investigating crimes, you're now on their radar they will know who you are the gangs will know who you are and that's what you do when you become a ghost hunter you're really putting yourself out there so any sort of demonic activity if you're any good at it like if you're a really bad bail bondsman or you're a cop and you never really arrest anyone then you're never you, you again you'll probably just have a passing knowledge of this stuff but if you're 
slightly good at any of these jobs, ghost hunting or bounty hunting, you will come to the attention of the people that you are hunting. And they'll be like, hey, did you hear what happened to last week? Benny got popped. Yeah, some dude, Jason Carpenter, came into this bar that Benny was at. And, and some guy showed up. I guess his name was Jason. The bartender said it. he identified himself as Jason. And he took Benny away. And then they would find out through different means court documents or whatever that my name is Jason Carpenter and I was the guy who got their friend. And so when you hunt ghosts, you actually can rack up an enemies list. You can rack up a list of entities who know who you are. And I think it's, this is my theory that the sister has moved on. The sister is at peace and no longer addicted to drugs and feels bad about it, but is now in a place where you don't feel bad. The sister has moved on. She's at peace. She's in a better place, literally. But what is coming to the houses is not Melissa. It's something more sinister than that. It's making her living family members feel unwelcome. It's scaring them. It's terrifying them. And whatever this thing is, is doing a good job at it. And in a genius way, it is destroying Melissa's legacy. Because Melissa wasn't perfect, and they've all had bad interactions with this young woman. But they are going to now think that Melissa hated them so much, was so broken and damaged in life, that she continues to haunt them in death. There's the old saying, beware if you stare into the abyss, eventually the abyss will stare back. And that's true. But in this case, the abyss did more than just stare back. Something crawled out of it and has taken Melissa's memory, twisted it, perverted it, and now lives as her on Earth. It will test Rebecca's love for her lost sister, pushing her to the edge, making her fear her sister even more now than she did when she was alive. After all, when Melissa was alive, you could always lock the door and call 911. But now that something has taken her place in death, it's always in the home. Always watching. Always waiting. Always standing in the darkness. Ready to make this young family pay dearly. Because Melissa stared into the abyss. DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be our email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash deadrabbitradio. TikTok is at deadrabbitradio. Dead Rabbit Radio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day, but I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great weekend, guys. Peace.